Thanks, Moira. Now, we have a very special guest, but before I introduce her to you, I want you to take a look at this. We've talked a lot about East Stanley Jones over the last few months, and we're having a special emphasis the next few days on uh, him again with this marvelous uh, book, Victorious uh, Living. But uh, take a look at this old clip. You can't look down on himself anymore. All that self-hate and self-loathing and self-rejection drops away. He says, I accept myself in God. I love God, therefore I can love myself. I love God supremely, therefore I can love myself subordinately. Now he walks the earth at home with himself and God. He's superior. Somebody said to a Negro, why don't you accept your inferiority? He said, how can I? I'm a child of God. If you're a child of God, you're not inferior. You're in the family of God. And that can be said of the outcasts of India, anybody, anywhere. Well, Dr. Jones, is it just as wrong then to have self-pity as it is to have self-conceit? Yes. Yes, I think it's just as wrong to have self-hate as it is to have other hate and self-pity as to have self-conceit. Con uh, self-pity self drops away and self-conceit drops away. You say, I'm just a person under redemption. I'm a Christian in the making. That's what we call ourselves, Christians in the making. But we're being made, and that makes the difference. Now, that was um, E. Stanley Jones. His granddaughter is with us, Anne Matthews Eunice, who lives in Washington, D.C., and uh, she has put together a marvelous book of selected sermons of her grandfather called Living Upon the Way. Um, I don't know if we've got a, there we go. Take a look, look at that lovely book. Published by Lucknow Publishing House. And uh, as I was reading it uh, over the last few days, I was first of all impressed with your selection, Anne. Uh, you, you had to select these, 50, is it 15 uh, mm -hmm. sermons out of about 100 or, or more that you had? They're about 100 sermons, yes. Yeah, and, and you, you tried to choose sermons, as you say here in the introduction, that uh, reflected the essential, uh, you don't use this word, but the essential DNA of, of his ministry and who he was, how he saw the world, how he saw preaching and so on. Um, did you have much contact with uh, your grandfather in your younger years? Oh, yes. Um, he was always spent Christmas with us, and that was a time of excitement. And then when I was a young adult, after college, I traveled with him for three months in India, and then again three months in Africa. And after he had his stroke in um, 1972, my father, brother, and I, we went back to India with him. That's where he wanted to be, and that's where he was cared for in the last few months of his life. Now, um, when we had Dean Merrill on, who has produced this, uh, uh, reproduced this marvelous uh, devotional called Victorious Living, he mentioned to me in the interview that, uh, oh, there's the book right there. Um, and that's what we're offering you for the next few days, friends. We'll tell you more about that in a minute. But Merrill mentioned to me that um, there were some who estimated your grandfather preached over 60,000 times. We're thinking, how is it possible to, to speak so many times? Now, you traveled with him. Tell us how it's possible. Uh, I heard it. <laughs> I heard it. He would preach six to seven times a day. And these were not 20-minute sermons. These were 45-minute lectures. And then he would always open himself up to questions from the audience. And the audience was a non-Christian audience, generally, of lawyers and uh, business people and judges and physicians. And the questions were hard questions. And I was worried for him. I had no need to worry. He was never provocative or testy. He answered the questions because he was speaking for Christ. That's who he was talking about and he found his audiences receptive. At the end of the day, I was tired, he was not. Yeah, boundless energy. Now, why do you suppose he had such an appeal? Was he intentional about doctors and lawyers and professional people, well-educated people? Was that something he set his mind to do? Yes, um, he was not, he, he was playing tennis. He was a very strong um, athlete, and that's no doubt why he was able to be as healthy and as vigorous for so long. And he was talking with some of his friends after a tennis game. These were Indian judges. And the judge said, why don't you come to us? Why are you going to the, um, the uneducated people? He said, well, I thought you wouldn't be interested. The judge said, we would be interested, but you have to come in the right way. And that's what he determined. The right way was to offer Christ, not Western civilization, not the Christian church. He decided, I have Christ in my life. I'm going to offer Christ, and his audiences were interested in Christ without the trappings. He was way ahead, way ahead of his time in some ways, in that he um, he recognized the um, 
almost imperceptible and yet for sure tie there is between the message of Christ as Western missionaries are presented and Western culture. Uh, he, he used to dress like an Indian. He mm -hmm. had a lot of Indian friends. He and Mahatma Gandhi were, were, were uh, good friends. Uh, he, he met with Nehru. Um, what, was this something that he kind of stumbled onto? What, did, did he have a mentor who uh, instructed him or was it just his own sense of being led by the Holy Spirit? I think he was led by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. He got it. He got it that it was Christ that he needed to present to the non-Christian world. He once asked Gandhi this question. He said, Mahatma, what should the Christian church do to be naturalized in India? And Gandhi said, the following. He said, you must act more like Christ. You must make love your operating motive for that's core to Christianity and you must study more sympathetically the non-Christian religions. Which he did. Which he did. Now, how, how is it that he um, became so highly regarded uh, back in the States uh, by the president and others uh, and, and was nominated, uh, you say in your book, twice for a Nobel Prize. I thought it was just once. It was uh, twice. How, uh, okay, it was twice. Well, how, how did he ma uh, attain that kind of uh, respect and stature from the, the non-church community. Well, he spoke for the general population, and even the general population needs to hear the word of God. He um, was also very active in reaching out. So if he had something to say to a president, he was not shy about writing a letter to the president. If he had something to say to any person in power, it was also very clear to me and very clear to him that he had to speak out on on issues, issues of racism in our country. He would never hold a public meeting if it was segregated. Everything was always integrated or he wouldn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't speak. Yeah, he hated racism. He hated racism. Which, which raises an interesting point because he had a, a very profound impact on an emerging uh, civil rights leader by the name of uh, of uh, Dr. Uh, now, now Martin, just, uh, Luther. Martin Luther King. He's had a brain cramp. Can you believe it? Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King. I mean, uh, in fact, in 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 the book, uh, he's quoted uh, as to the impact that your grandfather had on him. The story that my mother tells me it was just it was at Boston University, just as Dr. King was preparing to go to Scandinavia to receive the Nobel Peace Prize, and was introduced to my parents in line, and somebody mentioned my grandfather, and my. Martin Luther King stopped, turned to my mother, and said very seriously, I want to tell you about your father and the impact he had on me. Of course I knew about Gandhi's nonviolence, but I had no sense of how to use that method within a Christian context until I read his book, my grandfather's book, mm -hmm. Mahatma Gandhi, Portrait of a Friend. And then in the Martin Luther King Library in Atlanta, here under a glass case is that book with Martin Luther King writing in the margin, this is it, this is the way to achieve freedom for our people. Yeah, you know, I, when, I, when I read that in the book, I'm just trying to find, yeah, uh, this is it. This is the way to achieve freedom for the Negro, he, he calls him, in America. Um, your, your grandfather would not have had any idea that he would be so profoundly influencing such a profound influencer. I mean, he, he, was, just, he was just writing about, my, uh, my, about Gandhi, he was expressing his worldview. Uh, in many ways, I don't know if he had any peers, did he? Like, was there anybody in the Methodist Church or anyone in, in Protestant ministry who, who was a kind of a kindred spirit of your grandfather? Well, certainly the people he spoke with, and one of the things that he determined as an evangelist, he said to himself, he said, you know, the evangelist is always telling other people what to do. I need to be in a spiritual fellowship where other people can tell me what to do, where I can get feedback. And so part of the reason he established the Christian ashram movement in India, making it indigenous using a an Indian word, was so he could live in a close-knit fellowship. They often reviewed his books and would say, Brother Stanley, that's a little too harsh. That's not Christ-like enough. Say it another way. Really? Ashram, I think you mentioned your book means from hard work. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a retreat. Yes, it's a Sanskrit word, away from work. In the Hindu culture, the guru is a human teacher, mm -hmm. but in the Christian ashram, the guru is Jesus Christ. Right, right. Now, I think we have a picture of you and your grandfather here back when you were just a little girl, if I'm not mistaken. Well, I'm at a Christian ashram with him. Oh, there you go. How old were you there, about 10 or 11? Oh, a little younger. A little younger. And how old would your grandfather have been at that point? He would have been in his late 70s. Really? Huh. Now, when he traveled so much, and this is a question I asked um, uh, Merrill when he was here, and he couldn't really answer it very well. When he traveled so much, when he was always on the go, um, he mustn't have had a lot of time at home. I mean, he, uh, you, you, your grandmother must have been a remarkable gal to put up with so much absence. 
She was remarkable. She had Quaker stock, and she was also a Methodist and founded a boys' school in India. And she instituted the tradition of having, at that point, women did not teach young boys. She felt very strongly, as did Gandhi, they corresponded back and forth, that young boys need to be taught by women. She would often say, I'd rather spend two weeks a year with E. Stanley Jones, my husband, than 365 days with anybody else. <laughs> she was quite a woman. Wow. Uh, but did she ever travel with him the way you did? I mean, you spent, what, three months in, in India with him and three months in Africa with him? Yes, yeah, she was in India until yeah. 19, in the, the mid-1940s. Right. But she was occupied, she was also a missionary, and her assignment was to be a school teacher. So she accepted um, the assignment and the gift that she was given, and my grandfather was released for full-time evangelistic work. You know, they really ministered at the height of an era, didn't they? I mean, th that, this was a time when a lot of missionaries would actually leave their children uh, behind, you know, in boarding schools whenever, because they felt the call of God to mm -hmm. this, this foreign culture. It's something that uh, most uh, families would not do these days. And I don't say it's right or wrong, but there was this powerful idealism that they had. Well, they were led by the Spirit. My mother was, of course, born in India, and she remained in India until she was married in 1940. So she spent time, she did go to boarding school for a period of time, but spent a lot of time with her, her parents were obviously both in India. She also traveled with my grandfather. When she got out of college, my grandfather said, Eunice, I haven't spent enough time with you. Um, give me the next year of your life and travel with me. So she did the same thing. Huh. Well, we're going to continue, friends, with this uh, delightful interview with Ann Matthews Eunice tomorrow. But we want to give you an opportunity to um, get access to this remarkable Victorious Living study by E. Stanley Jones. It's uh, been made to look like it's off the shelf of a hundred year old library. It's kind of beat up looking and it's wonderful. It's wonderful feeling in the hands. But you can write us here at Post Office Box 5100, Burlington, Ontario, L7R4M2. In the U.S., Post Office Box 486, Niagara Falls, New York, 14302, or you can call 1-800-265-3100, or log on to crossroads.ca. Remember your best ministry gift, friends, when you call in. We, we just uh, are so uh, uh, keen on this partnership between us and you as we do this on a daily basis. And as I promised, tomorrow, Ann Matthews Eunice continues with us. So I won't even say goodbye. We'll be back. <laughs>